Anchor Television, brought to you by Sportsman's Warehouse, America's premier outfitter, Peterson Toyota and Toyota Trucks, moving forward. Coldwell Banker, every day until it's sold. St. Croix Ride, best rides on earth. Evan Rude, spend more time on the water. Good morning and welcome to Fishbowl Thinker. I'm Chad Lachance and we appreciate you joining us on a freezing cold late fall day here in Wolford Mountain Reservoir in Colorado, just outside of Kremlin, Colorado. If you look behind me, there's a whole bunch of landlocked sockeye salmon, otherwise known as kokanee salmon. We've got a whole bunch of light tackle here and we're gonna try to catch some of these fish. I have never personally seen a kokanee salmon until today. Really looking forward to figuring out how to do it. We're gonna wing it like we do in a lot of episodes of Fishful Thinker. We did a little reading. We spent some time on fishexplorer.com. We talked to some biologists and now we're here to see if we can catch them. So it ought to be interesting to see if I can figure out how to get these kokanee salmon to bite. They're easy enough to find, but they're not feeding well because they're on a false spawn. So we'll see how it goes. It should be a fun show. <laughs> so, in the typical things here at Fishful Thinker, we like to do it a little different than everybody else, and I have lost my net, so I'm gonna have to give this guy some line. Now, I got this kokanee that was all kinds of aggressive and chasing everybody around, so I threw a jerk bait down there. And sure enough, if he didn't come right over there, I just suspended it right by him. He just rolled over there and been grabbed it. So we got him hooked right in the corner of the mouth. And now we have netted him, and you can see that jerkbait hooked right in the corner of his mouth. Perfect kokanee hookup right there. How cool is that? Now, since we are going to harvest these fish, they're going to die. So I'm not really overly concerned with you know the fish handling and all that. We're going to take this fish home and smoke it. So let me get him out of here and see how he looks. But uh, this is literally the first kokanee salmon I've ever seen alive. Beautiful kokanee salmon. First one I've ever personally laid my hands on. And uh, absolutely gorgeous big male. Look at the jaw on this fish right here. Bring him up here, look at the jaws. Big giant chompers on him. All kinds of ticked off. And, uh, and got him with a jerk bait. And, and no one, oh, no one thinks of fishing for salmon with jerk baits. But my theory is this, he's being territorial. So why wouldn't a jerk bait that's all crazy and erratic and then left right near him make him turn around and bite it? And that one turned around and bit it right on cue. Just came up and nipped it. Absolutely perfect. So very, very cool fish. Gonna be great with some dip. And we're real happy to have it. It's the first one I've ever seen. It's actually a landlocked salmon, a landlocked sockeye salmon, I should say. Uh, we'll show you the efforts of the Colorado Division of Wildlife to, to stock these guys, but what a cool fish right there. All right, you just saw us land the first kokanee salmon I've ever personally laid eyes on as far as, uh, as far as angling for them. And you can see there's tons of them right here. Why did I choose a jerk bait? I've never heard anybody catching a kokanee salmon with a jerk bait. Here's why I chose it. It's very bright pink. It's very erratic action. It's a suspending jerkbait and it will stop completely. When I stop it, it stops immediately and doesn't move. That proved to be the trigger on that big male. Turned around and just nipped it. He didn't like it sitting there right next to him and he bit it. Really, really cool fish. Uh, you can see them fighting back here. If you look around, you can see several of them fighting. And because of that, that's really what prompted me to try to get one to react on a bait. Here at Fishful Thinker, we try really, really hard to do to, to really think about why fish bite lures besides feeding them. Feeding them is great, but these guys are not eating, so feeding them is very difficult. However, they are fighting, so getting them to bite a jerk bait that's six inches long and hanging in their face, that's a key way to get them to go, and it worked perfectly. I literally have made maybe 10 casts as a kokanee angler, and I just caught my first one, so pretty neat stuff. Keep that in mind. Well, they're hard to hook, I'm noticing. These guys have very, very bony jaws, as I've only showed you so far. Only the males have actually bit it. Uh, we had a female come sniff it. Oh, that one just bit it right there. Oh, you can see them. They're just bumping the bait. They're more nosing it than fully biting it. Okay, since I have a second rod stamp, I've got a bobber, I've got a four foot leader, I've got a little orange jig, and I tipped it with a little tiny pink fish fry that's made out of gulp. And uh, if you watch Fishful Thinker, you know we like the gulp. I'm throwing it out to the deeper fish that I can't see, but I know are out there because occasionally they come to the surface. And I'm just letting that bait sit and drift with the breeze. 
hopefully it'll get picked up as well so I can have a real aggressive technique and a really calm technique and potentially get fish to go on either one. It's kind of interesting, uh, kind of a one-two punch. One of the most common baits for people to use would be a wax worm. A lot of guys like a wax worm uh, for, for uh, you know, kokanee salmon, tipping your jigs. I'm not a fan of, of bait. It's just a personal thing of mine. I've had such good success with gulp over the years that I don't feel like that bait's a requirement. But I've never caught salmon on it yet, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> got, got another trick to it. Now, this one did the same thing as the other one. He just swam up and nipped the bait sitting absolutely dead still. Now, you're going to notice right away, first he's all wrapped up in the line. Where's my pliers? We'll net him. Uh, I upsized. I got another jerk bait out, and it's bigger than the other one. All right. Now, he's hooked on the middle hook. You can see. Hooked right in the middle hook, right in the mouth. See that right there? You can see it. Boom. They're swimming up to the bait and just biting it, sitting dead still. And that, uh, that to me is a territorial response. They, they just don't want the bait in the area where they're trying to protect. You see this hook is right in the corner of the mouth right here. We'll get that one out. And he just literally, I'll show you the bait in a minute. Let me get this salmon out of the net. But he come up underneath it and bit it, sitting absolutely dead still. And. Uh, Another beautiful male. Look at those fangs on the front of that thing snoot. If he didn't have intentions of biting, he would not grow teeth like that. And we've observed these fish actually biting each other while we're sitting here. So I got a bigger jerk bait out than I had and just hanging in the area. And sure enough, they just can't stand it sitting there and they turn around and bite it. It's, uh, it's completely dead sticked for probably 15 seconds. And he bit it right smack dab in the middle treble hook, just like he knows what he's doing. Another one destined for the smoker. This is going to be tasty. I might not be a kokanee expert, but I'm learning quick. <laughs> one of the best parts about catching fish can often be eating those fish when you get back and sharing them with family and friends. But first thing you got to do is figure out how to get the fillets off the sides of those fish. And as an angler, you have a couple of options to, to look at when you're choosing a way to fillet your fish. The quickest and most convenient way to fillet fish is with an electric fillet knife like this. Some of them are cordless, some of them are not, but the bottom line is you plug this blade into the front of this thing and electricity will make the blades move for you. It can be a great choice for really bony fish or if you have a ton of fish that you have to fillet, for instance, a whole mess of crappies. If you've just got a few fish, like on today's show with our salmon, a traditional fillet knife like this is a better choice. I'm of the opinion that a traditional fillet knife does a better job of removing all of the meat from the fish with a little bit less waste, but it does require a little bit more skill and a little bit more time on the angler's behalf. But either way, your dinner will be better off if you choose your fillet knife based on the fish you need to fillet. All right, so we just got the other salmon and we got bit right away on the smaller jerk bait, but a lot of fish come up and look at it and they weren't really getting hold of it. And that was a, a number 10 x wrap, which is still a good size bait. That's the first one I showed you. Now I stepped it up to this big giant Lucky Craft bait. This one's six and a half inches long. The reason I got such a big bait is I wanted to present more of a threat to the kokanee. So I pull it down here and just let it hang there in the water column. The bait has to suspend. If it floats or sinks, they're not interested in it. The bait just sits there. I let it sit there and sooner or later one of them comes up and gets it. The last one that we just caught was on this hook right here, right in the mouth, and I watched him come up and bite it like a dog, right in the middle of the bait. Just clamp down just exactly like they're biting each other. We could see him do it. All right, so you can see, guys, the bait's just hanging there in the water column. Those coconuts are swimming all around it. So the whole thing is eventually one of them will turn around and bite it. As you watch, if you watch that bait, one of them will turn around and finally bite it. Like they just don't want it in that area and they'll turn around and get a hold of it. They've, oh, that one just went under it. He got me looking. <laughs> but they'll, uh, the funny thing about it is it seems like that they bite it on the middle hook, which is exactly how they're biting each other. So I'm not moving it. The bait's just sitting there. Any motion you see in that bait is being imparted by those fish swimming around it. But, uh, but I am not going to set the hook on anybody that I don't actually watch bite the bait, and that seems to be the right deal. And you can see that bait just sitting there. Here he comes. Oh, he fainted at it. One of them is going to bite it. And it's just a waiting game. You just kind of got to wait them out. It's a lot like fishing. Here comes another one looking at it real close. Not this time. But eventually one of them gets the wrong attitude about it. Oh. I got another male to bite it. <laughs>
It's just a matter of letting him nip it. Oh, he came loose. This one is going to end up being foul hooked. He was hooked in the mouth. I watched him bite it, but we're going to have to let him go because he did, uh, he did come out of his mouth. That's a problem with a bait with three trebles on it, is it did come out of his mouth, and therefore I am not going to count it. Although I did physically watch him bite the bait, we will not be harvesting this fish for that reason. You can see it got him in the fin. He originally had it in the corner of the mouth. But because of that, we will be letting him go because we will not be breaking any rules around here. We're going to pop him off and let him go about his business, maybe. See, buddy. But you can see it's another male, just like the others. I watched him come up and bite the bait. I know he bit it, but I'm still not going to take any chances with him. It is not legal to snag him here, so we're going to put that one back. But it was hooked in the mouth. While I was fighting him, he turned around and he hung one of the other trebles on it, and the one in his mouth came loose. So. Uh, Oh well, we don't get to eat that one, but we got to have fun with them. I'll tell you what, watching them bite is really the coolest thing. So that's, that's the part that I really enjoy about it. But speaking of watching, this next segment, we're gonna visit with John Ewart from the Division of Wildlife. And, uh, and he's basically responsible for overseeing, at least in this area of the state of Colorado, the kokanee salmon spawning process where the fish are trapped, they're milked and, uh, and artificially inseminated and then restocked around the state. It's gonna be a really neat clip. So uh, you guys watch this, it's really good information. So you can see these salmon in the river right here that are just coming up. And Scott here is a technician with the Colorado Division of Wildlife, and he works directly with John Ewart, who's overseeing this operation. Williams Fork Reservoir right behind us. Uh -huh. Give us a rundown. What's, a, what's the scoop on these salmon here? Uh, these salmon are basically three to four years old. Um, they're stocked in, in the Williams Fork. Williams Fork takes about 300,000 eggs a year to stock it. These fish will run up this season. We'll spawn them up at the trap that you saw. Um, you know, pretty simple. And these, so these fish will eventually make their way another 100 yards up the river here and get caught. Yep. And if they're green, they'll go in the buckets that we saw a little bit ago yep. and so on and so forth. Yep. Well, the ones that are green are not quite ready to spawn yet. We'll turn them back into the river. Hopefully the next spawn day, whether it's two or three days in between, they'll be ready to go. So then you'll get the ripe ones. Uh -huh. Very good. So these got a little bit of a journey left. One way or the other, their life's over with the end of this week, right? So spawn once and be done like all salmon. Yep, exactly. From what I've learned from the Division of Wildlife and through John and through others is that the reason that they go through the three to four year cycle and then spawn and die is that it's a Pacific Northwest fish. And in the Pacific Northwest, the nutrients in the river are low. So they're the ultimate parent. They swim up the river, they die to put nutrients back into the river system. To feed the young. babies. Yep. yep, that makes good sense. It's a perfect circle. Exactly. Thanks for your time. You got it. All right, so joining us right here, Mr. Johnny, we're from Colorado Division of Wildlife. He's a fisheries biologist that's overseeing the kokanee salmon harvest or, or spawn this year. In this part of the state, yep. In this part of the state. Yep. So the obvious question for a guy that's the expert here is why not just let them spawn in the river? Naturally. Um, they're not native to Colorado. They're from the Pacific Northwest originally. They're the landlocked form of sockeye salmon, and so they um, are not adapted to be able to spawn successfully here. They would lay the eggs, but it'd be a very low success rate on the hatching. So by you catching them artificially in these traps, you can spawn them with a much higher success rate, yep. plus be able to stock them in other places in the state. Yep. We usually have about 15 to 20% egg loss from the number of eggs we take out of here to the time the fish go back in the river. We have about a about 80% of the number of eggs that we take turn into fish. And that's, so, that's way better than you would do in the wild. Yeah, substantially. Now, the importance of stocking the kokanee salmon, obviously there's a return to creel. We want anglers to have them. But yep. what is their importance to other species in the state of Colorado? They, um, they're a planktivore, and so they're, our reservoirs are not very productive. They're cold, and basically the only thing they have uh, grown for them in terms of productivity is the plankton. And so they're, this, they're a sport fish that grows large and they eat plankton and they also provide a food base for large predators like lake trout and in Williams Fork, northern pike. We have actually quite a bit of northern pike predation on kokanee and Williams Fork. So they provide that critical link between plankton and large predators, which without that we wouldn't. The only thing, if we didn't have kokanee, the only thing that uh, large lake trout or pike would have to live off of would be just the stock of rainbows, and that's extremely expensive to grow a large trophy predator type fish off of just stock. Feed rainbows. them stock of rainbows, that makes good sense. Now the food, they have food value still. These fish respond out, they don't look great, but they still have some food value for, for everybody. Obviously we saw hunters gathered up to get their, 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 their catch. Yeah, they're great smoked or canned, and you can even throw them on the grill, wrap them up in tin foil, and put some lemon juice and stuff, and they're still good to eat. Um, when it gets real late in the spawn, sometimes they get a little bit 
you know, they're kind of uh, done for, they're mushy, the, the, all the body goes out of the meat kind of, but right now they're in good shape. Well, that makes good sense. John, we really appreciate you taking the time to visit with us about it here at Fishful Thinker. More importantly, for freezing your tail off out here in the morning and getting all these salmon for us. I know they're a critical link in Colorado. People might not realize how important they are, but the kokanee salmon's a big deal. Guys like this are making sure they're here for the future. I've got one of the more traditional kokanee methods going on right now. I've got a eighth ounce jig head, I've got a hot pink tube jig, and then I tipped that tube jig on top of it with uh, a little tiny pink uh, one inch gulp fish fry. So I got a little extra pink on there, a little extra flavor on there. Kokanees are well documented for liking pink. They're very well documented for liking tube jigs, uh, little feather jigs, egg flies, potentially uh, San Juan worms. If you're a fly fisherman, a, a red or a pink San Juan worm would be a good way to get them to go as well. But uh, there's fish right there and he bit, oh, and he came off. Aye. It's funny because they really don't bite very well. They bite, but they're hard to hook. They're bony mouth little guys and they're hard to hook. Ay, caramba. <laughs> it's fun though. And this is just an eight ounce tube jig, like I said. It's a real small little bait. I'll show it to you here in a second. I'm letting it go all the way to the bottom, and then I'm kind of scooting it. I'm finding that I have to keep, uh, when it comes to the little bait, I've got to kind of keep it moving and they'll turn around and bite it. Versus the big bait, it's just letting it sit there. What I'm finding out here real quick, when it comes to the jig, the deeper fish will bite it. And I, that tells me that those are the fish that are staging to come in here. They're still willing to bite something. They got a little bit different mindset. These fish that are up shallow are very aggressive with each other. And that's where I got it after them with the big bait to figure out what the deal was. But the, but the jig is definitely more effective out in the deep water. Well, <laughs> we foul hooked another one. Now I'm not into foul hooking these guys. And again, we will not be keeping them. This one, uh, bait was just swimming along. My line started swimming off, and I'm assuming he swam into it, and, uh, and we ended up foul hooking him. So we will not be keeping him, as I said, but, uh, but we've had enough of them that bite that I know we're in an area where they will bite, and so we'll be real quick about it's another gorgeous male. There you go, buddy. Oh, and he's all tangled up in somebody else's fishing line. Come here, fish. Look at this, guys. This is why you don't, come here. Come here, come here. This is why you don't leave your fishing line right there. I just let this fish go and look at what I found all tangled around him. No good guys, you can't leave fishing line on the side of the lake, but it did give us a chance to give this guy a look. We'll pick that fishing line up. There you go, buddy, go back to spawning. There it is right there. Somebody's nice rig right there. Just had that salmon all snagged up. Not a good plan right there. That is not responsible use of the resource. Here she's gonna bite it. No, not this time. He's now he's a little more reluctant this time. I kind of hung him on the nose when he got, here he's on it. Got him, oh, there you go. He just choked it. He just absolutely choked it. Oh man, how cool is that? <laughs> Holy smokes. Come here, buddy. Oh, you know what? I'm taking the other trebles off of this thing because this fish is now all tangled up in all the trebles and it's hard to tell which one he had first, which means that I really feel like we're gonna to need to let him go because I don't know where he originally bit the bait. I watched him bite it, but I don't, ouch, he got me with a hook. I watched him bite it, but he got, uh, again, got all this, this bait's got three trebles because it's such a big jerk bait and he came kind of unpinned from the first one and got one of the other trebles. And, uh, that was probably the most aggressive single bite I've had, but again, he gets turned around with all those trebles and comes off. But uh, we'll let him go. Uh, beautiful, big, beautiful, see you, buddy. <laughs> go on that way, there you go. Big, beautiful male, go on, you can do it. But uh, I mean, he literally just came right up to the bait and just thumped it, just absolutely thumped it. And uh, unfortunately, he got tangled. So what I'm gonna do, I think, is take the extra trebles off of this bait and then when they flop like that, they won't hang themselves all over the body. I'm taking no chances on breaking the rules and taking a foul hooked fish, even though I physically watched that fish bite the bait. Uh, the ones that are, they were catching are were catching on the center treble and that's where they're biting the bait. But during the fight, these other hooks are spinning around a treble and, and catching them all over. So I'll take the other hooks off, see what that does for us. Just hopping it. 
Seems like they'll bite it on the drop. There we go, just like that one. Just bit it on the drop. I just watched him do it. Oh, <laughs> just hopping the jig up in the air. Oh, he's gonna get me tangled my bobber line. This is a rookie, rookie move right here, guys. Okay, that did not go well. I just watched him eat it and uh, just hop in the jig and he just went over and grabbed it real quick. And uh, it's a nice one too, actually. Looks like a big female. She's got me wrapped in my bobber line here. Come here, baby. Oh, what a mess I just made. Come here, fish. Come here, fish. Come here, fish. Oh, she's all tangled up. Hang on. Oh, no. Come here. Uh, hang on, guys. There we go. All tangled up in my own fishing line. Nicely done. There it is, big female right there. Now I got to watch this one actually eat my jig. And that is so cool to go sight fishing for him and watch him bite the bait. And you can see his eggs will just come out. If you just pump her like this, the eggs will just come flowing out of her. That's what the Division of Wildlife has taken out of these fish. Beautiful female on the more traditional, on the little tiny pink tube jig with the, the little pink gulp fish fry on it. No hump on her back here. Beautiful fish and uh, I'll tell you what, I don't see it gonna get any better than this. We've caught fish, we're gonna have some dinner. We had some great conversations with the Division of Wildlife. We saw how they go about spawning the fish. This one's gonna be smoked dip here pretty soon. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this show. It's kind of fun, we're on the bank. It's a really unique type deal between the jerk bait and the tube jig and the slip bobber and then all the other stuff. It's a really neat way to catch fish. So hopefully you guys have enjoyed it and uh, hopefully you'll watch Fishful Thinker next week and see what other kind of non-traditional ways we can get out and get you fishing here in the West. Appreciate you watching. Oh, that one almost got it. Oh, oh. So I just released this other, or excuse me, just released him. This. Oh. oh. <laughs> so that's what happens when you leave a bobber out on one rod and you work a jig on another rod and then you get a salmon that gets you tangled in both of them. That is a rookie move right there. <laughs> oh, well.